And I'll tell you, if I was about 20 years younger, we'd get us a bus and I'd be your booking agent and away we'd go. They do a wonderful job, amen. Aren't you glad for all the talent that we have in our church, not just the talent on Sunday mornings, but all the upcoming talent that we have. And uh, what a wonderful job. Pastor Cody and Pastor Lauren are doing a wonderful job with our young people. And we greatly appreciate their sacrifice. They've been here all day. A lot of them stayed for a front line. They're a part of the front line uh, leadership on Sunday afternoons that we're doing right now. And then uh, immediately after that at 3 o'clock, they left to go practice for tonight. So, um, hey, they could have been off somewhere else. But uh, we praise God for their sacrifice and their talent and what they're doing for the Lord. Amen. Just a couple of things tonight before we move on. If you're planning to go to Nicaragua with us at the end of June, our trip could be canceled. If you've been watching the news lately of the past two weeks, uh, you know all of the turmoil that's going on in Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Nicaragua has been the safest country and the most peaceful country in South America since 1973. And uh, as of the past few weeks, you know, if you've watched and kept up with it, that uh, the presidency there has tried to take away the Social Security of the people that have worked for 50, 60 years. And uh, that caused a little bit of a problem. In fact, it caused a great big problem. And, and, and rightfully so, when you try to take away uh, what is rightfully someone. So we are watching that closely. Uh, I've been in contact with the missionary there last week. And those that we will be tra traveling with, uh, as towards the end of this past week on Friday, uh, things were calming down and uh, we're, we're relatively back to whatever normal may be. But uh, uh, over, the, over the weekend watching the news, uh, there have been some travel advisories. And so what I'd like to do is just ask you to pray. We want to use wisdom. So we want to use wisdom here and we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I would rather lose our deposit than lose our life. And uh, so, so we'll just see what happens. These are circumstances beyond our control. Who would have thought since 1973? And, uh, but it's the world we live in. It's the world that you and I live in. There is no safe place anymore. And uh, so please pray for that country uh, and pray for the people there. Immediately following this service or at the, when the altar service begins here in a few moments, if you're going to be baptized tonight, I'd like to ask you to please make your way to this side uh, of the sanctuary and in through this door over here to my right. And there will be some folks in there to help you to get ready to be baptized. Uh, we, were, we were going to baptize. We try to do communion once a month. We skip a month, then we try to baptize. And, uh, and people wanted to be baptized. And why wait till the end of next month to do it? Might as well go and do it now. In fact, in fact, I'll tell you, we ought to keep the baptismal full all the time. And it ought to be a regular thing happening, so we're looking forward to that. One thing I wanted to share with you before we move on is this coming summer, you're going to be seeing some new faces around. Uh, hopefully they are all in guests, uh, guests that come and join our church or in our, in our part of our church. But this coming summer, you're going to be seeing some new faces here on the platform and then possibly in the youth uh, as well as in our children's ministry, maybe other ministries. But what we're doing is start an internship program this year. And really, this is a great church. This church ought to be doing this all the time. We ought to have people that come from all over that want to intern in our church. We have the best music. We, we have some mediocre preaching. We have wonderful youth, wonderful children's department. So we ought to have people that want to come here and intern that are going to be going on to other parts of ministry. Uh, and, and, and other churches and so on. So, so you're going to see that start to happen in the next few weeks. Uh, we will have an intern that's going to be with us uh, working with Pastor Gary in the music department. Again, Pastor Gary, uh, Pastor Gary, hey, Pastor Gary, Pastor uh, Cody. Uh, we'll, we'll have some interns and then possibly our, our children's department will as well. So uh, when you start to see those new faces serving uh, and new interns, please be welcoming to them. Uh, we want them to want to come here. And uh, we want to teach them something. Now, listen, you don't take the microphone and beat them over the head if they're not doing what we normally do or whatever. Uh, but uh, we, we're, we're honored to be able to have uh, this opportunity to do this. And so we're looking, forward, we're looking forward to it. Several years ago, in fact, quite a few now, on a Sunday night just like this, my first time that I ever preached a sermon was actually, actually in Juarez, Mexico. Now you can hardly go. I don't believe that it would be very safe at all to go to Juarez. Uh, what as is just across the El Paso border. Joni and I have been there 
on missions trips. In fact, uh, Bailey was there on a missions trip before she ever drew her first breath on the outside. <laughs> how, how pregnant were we? We were about three or four months, and we rode on a school bus from Malvern, Arkansas to El Paso, Texas. That will make you have a baby. Where's Amber? Amber? Go get a bus. Brant, go pull the school bus outside. Amber's having this child tonight. We're going to ride her around town on this school bus. Where's the rest of them that's with child? Morgan, she's here. We'll just have them tonight. But uh, so we, we uh, have been to Juarez several times doing schools, building schools onto churches and different things. My very first time to preach ever, we were there adding on to a church uh, in downtown Juarez, and I was on the block laying crew. We were laying the blocks, and I, my part of the job was to, was to uh, hand the blocks up to the guys that were laying the blocks. And in the middle of that day, very hot day, I don't remember, it was in August, I think, and uh, Brother Norton, we were on a trip with several different churches, and Brother Norton walked out, and he said, uh, I've got to go back to the United States. We just had somebody in our church pass away. You're preaching tonight. And I stood there and I said, nope, I am not preaching tonight. We're in a foreign country. I don't speak Spanish at all. I don't know anybody and I'm not preaching. And of course he uses the thing, you know, you're submitted to me, aren't you? And I said, don't pull the God stuff on me here. I'm not, I am not preaching tonight. I've never preached in my life, Brother Norden. And he said, he said, you're preaching tonight. I got to go. So I told him, you got to put me on a van. They took me back to the hotel. I laid in the floor the rest of the afternoon, crying and screaming for the Lord to give me some kind of message. And I have the sermon, if you could call it that, in there still in my desk. I laid down on the floor and I wrote down about Paul. And I had to use an interpreter. And uh, the place was full, dirt floor. The place was full that night. I'm quite sure it's not what I said that got people to the altar. At the end of the sermon, I looked at the interpreter and said, man, you did a wonderful job, whatever you said. I walked off the platform that night. We were there with some guys from Canada, and they were the actually the block layers that I was handing the blocks to. We'd been working with these guys. They were built about like this this, uh, pulpit is. I walked off the platform. I handed my Bible to Joni, and I said, I will never do that again. Never. We turned around to walk off, and one of these great big guys that was there with us, that was one of the block layers, he looked at me and said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, did you preach what God gave you to preach? I said, I believe I did. He said, did you say what you believe God put in your heart to say? I said, I believe I did. He said, then don't ever say you won't never do it again, because God will turn that right around and make you do what you said you'd never do again. I've never not wanted to preach since that moment on. It is, I would rather preach than eat. A few weeks later, after we had returned back to the United States, again, Brother Norton came to me one day and said, I've got to be gone tonight on a Sunday night. You're going to preach tonight. I was scared out of my ever-loving mind. Even more so because now I'm preaching to people that know me. (laughs) Now I'm preaching to people that sit here in front of me all the time. They're going to judge me. They're going to talk about me. They're going to laugh at me. They're going to do all of that. And that night I got up and I preached as hard as I could and I've been doing it ever since. And I praise God for somebody that gave me an opportunity. I said, I praise God for somebody that gave me an opportunity. I still have that sermon in there in my desk and and go back and read it every once in a while and I pray for all of the people that were there that night. Lord, please help them to have gotten something. But I wouldn't be where I am tonight if somebody had not given me a chance and had not given me an opportunity. And so tonight, in understanding that there's a generation coming behind us, and it was afforded the opportunity to me, tonight I'm gonna afford someone else the opportunity that was afforded to me. Hunter Dunn has been felt like he has called to be a pastor. He walked into my office about a year ago on a Wednesday night. He said, I need to talk to you. And I said, fine, let's talk. He walked over and sat down at the chair in front of my desk and he slid up on the edge of the chair and he slapped my my desk just like that. He said, I want to know how to do what you do. I'm going to do what you do. And I said, then Hunter, if that's what you're going to do, then here's the things that you're going to have to do to qualify yourself. And here's the things that you're going to have to do to get to be able to stand in this pulpit. 
And I'll tell you tonight, Hunter's done every single one of those things. He has applied himself. He's made himself available. He prays, not to say that anyone else here has done it, not done any of these things, but he has done what he sat there and said that tonight. So tonight, with great honor and privilege, would you welcome to this pulpit, Reverend Hunter Dunn. Thank you. I um, thank you, Pastor Britt. Uh, being raised in this church my whole life and in Pentecost, growing up, I, I didn't do what I needed to do to serve God. But there came a time in my life where I needed to uh, make a decision. And I needed to make a decision whether or not I was going to follow God or follow myself. And I want to say thank you, Pastor Britt, for this opportunity, for not only being my pastor and for not only being raised in this great church and in, in the youth group. I, I've seen many things just growing up, and, and I'm so thankful that God allowed me to be a part of a great church. And can you put it, can you just uh, give Pastor Britt a hand clap of praise and even uh, the staff of this church? Like I said again, I can't. I can't thank Pastor Britt enough. I can't thank you enough. It's an honor not only for you to be my pastor and my friend, but even my mentor. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 19, and starting in verse 17. Again, it's an honor to have this opportunity to preach. I'll never forget this. Tonight, as I was trying to figure out what I believe God laid on my heart. Pastor Brett asked me Monday night if I would, if I would preach. I just kind of just froze for a minute. I'm like, did he really just ask me that? But I, I went home that night and I began to pray. And the sermon that I'm preaching tonight is a sermon that I actually thought of about three or four months ago. And I found myself preaching this sermon in this church. And I pray tonight that this word will just be an encouragement word to somebody, and I pray that God will do something awesome in this place. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, in Genesis chapter 19, verse 17, it said, When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives, and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. Oh no, my lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life, and you have shown such great kindness. But I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there, and I would soon die. See, there is a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said, I will grant your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry. Escape to it, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. This explains why the village was known as Zor, which means little place. From verses 23 through 26, I want you to pay close attention. I want you to take, I want you to take a picture of what is happening in the story and in Sodom and Gomorrah at this time. I would like for you to go back to the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 23, it said, Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He utterly destroyed them along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. Verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. For a few moments, I would like to speak on the subject, don't look back. Don't look back. Lord, I pray tonight, God, Lord, that you will anoint me as I speak, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, and I curse any distraction, God, that is in the church today, God. Lord, I pray that, that every heart and every ears and everything will be open today to hear the voice of God. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in this service. And everybody said, amen. 
We see in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and even before the story begins, we see that Abraham's faith has given him a special b- position with God. You see, the Lord knew Abraham because Abraham knew the Lord. We see that this important individual named Abraham has had the opportunity of intercession. We see before the good Lord was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, we see that Abraham, he has been pleading with God on the people's behalf. We see that Abraham, he has been bargaining with God until 10 people were found righteous in the city. We see that the Lord has promised Abraham that Lot would be spared so destruction could not come to Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot was safely removed. I truly believe and since this is talking about the rapture of the church and the judgment day of God, which I do believe cannot fully come until all believers are completely removed. You see, I believe as the world that you and I are living in today, it is reminding us of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, Lot, he was a righteous man, but he was living in a very disobedient city. I said he was living in a sinful world in a disobedient city. You see, Lot himself, he had a choice. You see, you have to understand tonight that Lot, he had the choice of raising his family outside of the gates. He had the opportunity of raising his family in in, in a more of a godly way. And still he could have attempted to tell the people of Sodom and Gomorrah about the true and the living God. Tonight, let me pause for a minute. You might think that I'm preaching on how we need to remember Lot, but I want to talk to you on how we need to remember Lot's wife. You see how we need to remember Lot's wife. In Luke chapter 17, verse 32, we see three powerful words that have been spoken by Jesus himself. Remember Lot's wife. So I truly believe and since we need to pay close attention to, to, the, to the lady named... You see, Lot's wife has heard about the destruction that is coming to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we find ourselves as morning came, she found herself as morning came. She rose as her husband did, and she was ready to leave the house. I truly believe as when the story said that the two angels, they came to Lot and they told Lot, I want you to go out and I want you to get your family and I want you to leave the house. I truly believe that Lot's wife herself, she ran down the streets, she passed the city gate and she reached the open plain along with her husband. You have to understand tonight that she had the opportunity of running away. You see, she had, she went part of the way towards safety. I said she went part of the way towards safety, but yet she perished. But yet you find out that her heart was still in Sodom. You see, she, you have to understand tonight that the Bible says, remember Lot's wife. So therefore I must let the husband go. And you and I, we must call our attention, in in this case, to her, who in this case is his worst half. You see, when the time for separation arrived, Lot's wife could not tear herself away from the world. She had always been in the world, and she had always loved it and delighted in it, but you have to understand, uh, when the time came for separation, be, she betrayed her true character. I said, when the time came for separation, uh, she betrayed her true character. God commanded, and he said, get the people out. Lot and his family, they begin to leave, but you have to, but you need to know tonight that Lot's wife, her heart was still in Sodom. I said her heart, uh, it was still in Sodom. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 24 through 25, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. You see, when you begin to understand the magnitude of the destruction, the utter devastation of the people and of the land, you see there is a huge sadness that creeps into the heart of man. I said when someone falls into temptation, when someone sins, we are all accountable for that. You see, we all have to deal with that. I believe God himself, he felt this sadness when men fall into temptation. And when they come short, the Bible said, for all have sinned. come short of the glory of God. You see, tonight, I want to talk to you tonight just for a few moments before I, be, before I get to my point about how, we, how I want to talk to you about the judgment of fire. You see, the judgment of God. 
are very scary words for most people today. Partly this is due to the church portraying judgment as a horrible and fearful thing, involving sentencing to many to an eternity of insane torture by fire. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15, then I saw a great white throne and him, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And the Bible said, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, tonight I come to you tonight to speak to you tonight of the revelations of God. Tonight I come to speak to you tonight about the doomed and the damned, about page after page I've read in the word of God, that page after page God is telling you and I today that there will someday be a great separation between the lost and the saved. There will be a great separation separation between those who have been forgiven and those who have been I said there will be a day page after page I've read in the Bible and I read the story of the five wise virgins and the maidens who entered into the kingdom of God and the five foolish who were left out and the door was completely shut. I read the page in, in the Bible and, it, and I read the story of the parable or the story of the great judgment day of God and as God shall divide the saved from the lost. Uh, you see, I turned the page and I read in the book of the Bible in the back book that there was a great separation. I said there uh, was a great separation and anyone not found written in the book of life uh, was cast into the lake of fire. And another book was open, which is the book of life. See, I believe that there will be a book in which everything that we say, in which everything that we do are recorded. But I believe in one book called the book of life, I believe... In this book are those who have been redeemed. Come on, I, I believe in this book are those who have been redeemed, who have been washed in the blood, who have been saved from sin, who have come to the foot of the cross through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something today, young person. There's only one way, and it's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible said Anyone whose name is not found in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire to be tormented forever. I want you to know the importance of what I'm preaching to you tonight. You see, it does not matter how much money you got. It does not matter how many likes that you get on social media. It does not matter how much biblical knowledge that you may receive every single day. You see, the what happened to Lot's wife, when she looked back, I come to tell you tonight that you don't need to be looking back to your past. You don't need to be looking back to the things of yesterday. I come to tell you tonight that God He's about to do a new thing. He's about to show up and he's about to blow your mind. You see, tonight, one of these, one of these days, we will all stand before God. We will all stand before God if the rapture happens this very moment or if you go on to be with Jesus. We will all stand before God and we will all give an account. And I truly believe if you do not make it to heaven, I truly believe, number one, it's because you did not come through the shed blood, and number two, because you chose to look back. You chose to look back. You see in this story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you see that Lot's wife, she chose to look back. I said she chose to look back. She had the opportunity God gave her the opportunity of moving forward. God gave her the opportunity of salvation. But yet you have to understand tonight that her heart was still in that city. I said her heart was still in that city. I come to not to tell you that some of you, you're not moving forward simply because your heart is still 
in that city. Uh, your heart is still in addiction. Uh, your heart is still in. We are living in a sinful world today where numbers of people do not have more concern, have no concern about eternal things. You see, they care more about their cats and they care more about their dogs than they do about their own eternal souls. And I truly believe in the world that we are living in today, it is a great mercy to be made to think and how we stand towards God in the eternal world. I truly believe that this is a full often sign that salvation is coming to us, but we are like slugs. We try to sleep again and we are looking back when all along God is wanting us to look forward Florida. You see, in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, they had the opportunity. Uh, they, God would warn them, and the judgment of fire came. You see, there is a natural human tendency for us to look back, right? I said there's a natural human tendency for you and I to look back. See, we all have yearbooks. We all have photo albums. We all have so kinds of memories that allows us all to look back. You see, there is good in looking back, but you have to understand that there is great in looking forward. I looked up this word, look back, and it said to think of or remember what has happened in the past, to gaze back and to try to get a view of, get a view of someone or something to gaze back and to try to get a view of someone or something. You see, that's exactly what Lot's wife, that's exactly what Lot's wife did. She gazed back at the city of her birth. She gazed back at the place that she was raised. She gazed back at the things that she was holding on to and the Bible said that she was turned into a pillar of salt. I believe that in the heart of man that there is a danger in looking back. I truly believe that there is a danger in looking back, not only for your soul and not only to where you will spend eternity, but I truly believe that there is a danger of looking back. Listen to me tonight, I come to tell you that if you keep looking back, you are going to miss what God is about to do in your life. You see, it's not only about your soul and where you will spend eternity, but it is about that you will miss what God is trying to do in your life. See, there can be great value in looking back. We look back to learn. We look back to affirm the places and even the faces in which we have seen in the past. You see, I do not believe that Lot's wife just glanced back. I understand she gazed back, but the Bible said that when the judgment of fire came, they told him to run, get out of the city. I do not truly believe, I do not believe that they were just walking, but I truly believe that they ran, but, but I come to a point where I, where, where I truly believe that she had to make a decision. She had to make a decision, and I truly believe that Lot's wife just did not glance back, but I truly believe that she stopped. I truly believe that she completely stopped running and she gazed back at the city of her birth, which was, which was now being destroyed by brimstone and fire. You see, perhaps she did not believe that the danger would reach her or she would even be turned into a pillar of salt, but she did. You, she, you see, she had been told specifically, don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plane, but you have to understand that she did look back and she did stop. Perhaps she did not believe that the danger would reach her, but it did. I said, but it did. I said she looked back, she stopped so many times. We just stop when God's about to do something. I said we stop in difficulty. We stop in the middle of the storm. You see, we stop when it's 1159, but she looked back. And the Bible said that she was turned into a pillar of salt. I truly believe that she looked back. She looked back to her wealth. She looked back 
to all of the clothing, all of, all of the clothings and the jewelries in which she had. I truly believe that she looked back. Lot's wife looked back. And you and I, we cannot afford to look back in the day that we are living in today as we come to the end. I truly believe that Jesus is coming soon. I said, I truly believe that Jesus is coming soon. And I truly believe that God is ready to pour out the Holy Ghost in this church. I truly believe that God is about to do a new thing in this church. Listen, we can't afford to look back to miss the thing that God is about to do. I truly believe I'm speaking to specific people tonight. I Truly believe that you've been looking back on your sickness after God already spoken it into your life saying that you would be healed. Said you're looking back in fear at the fact that your son or even your daughter isn't going to come back into the family of God. But listen, God already promised that for you that they would. You see, what you need to do tonight is stop looking back is stop looking back to the things of yesterday. Stop looking back to the things of yesterday and focus on the now, focus on moving forward. God has a plan, God has a purpose. He said, for I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. You You see, tonight I'm not just warning you or am I speaking to you tonight about the consequences of looking back for your eternal soul and where you will spend eternity one of these days. But I truly believe that tonight it is a warning to not look back to miss what God is about to do in your life. I truly believe that God is wanting to do something in your life. You might not feel God at this time. You might even feel as if God is a million miles away. But I pray that faith will get a hold of you tonight. And I pray that you'll catch the fire of the Holy Ghost. You see, I'm speaking to people tonight. Uh, The Lord is about to place some of you in specific ministries and he's going to cause the blessing of God in your life. Uh, Some of you, you've been trying to figure out what God is calling you to do uh, and you've been asking God the question, God, what are my gifts? Uh, Well, I come to tell you that God is about to show you this very night. In Isaiah chapter 43, 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Behold, I will do a new thing. You see, the Israelites needed to remember when God delivered them out of the captivity from Egypt. And they needed to realize that these past miracles were nothing compared to the miracles that were still to come. I said they needed to realize that the miracles in the past, it was when God put them through the Red Sea, when he opened up the Red Sea. They needed to understand that God was wanting to do a new thing. They're now in captivity. And tonight... You see, they're in captivity, but they did not need to look back on the former blessings of the past, that they would miss a divine opportunity of seeing God do a new thing among them. You might be here tonight and you might feel as if you're in a state of captivity. You might be here tonight and you might feel like you're in a state of bondage, but if you will remember how God rescued you out of Egypt and if you will remember how God brought you through that Red Sea, listen, God will help you overcome temptation. Uh, God will help you get through that marriage. Uh, God will help you get through that divorce. Uh, If you will stay faithful to God, uh, God will stay faithful to you. Uh, If you take care of God's business, he'll take care of your business. As I was preparing this sermon, the Lord dropped that, dropped that verse in my heart. Behold, I will do a new thing. Somebody needs to hear that tonight. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I believe tonight that God is about to open doors that no man can shut. I truly believe that God is about to heal somebody tonight. I believe that God is going to set somebody 
free tonight. I believe that God can still fill you with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. The Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God give it the utterance today. I'm speaking to families in the church tonight. I pray that prosperity, I pray that the blessing of God, and I pray that a supply of manna will fill your household tonight. I believe for this church tonight, as we are making a run to the rapture of the church, you better believe that God is about to pour out the Holy Ghost among you tonight. You better believe in the church today that hundreds of souls will be won to the kingdom of God. You better be... The Lord said it. Behold, I will do a new thing. Behold, I will do a new thing. Where is the faith today in the church? Where is faith in the church today? The Bible said if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to that mountain, move, and it will move. Behold, I will do a new thing. If we want something new, if we want to see the blessing of God, if you want to see the anointing upon your life, if you want to see your marriage put back together, if you want to see your finances and, and you must tithe, if, 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 you want, if you want God to bless you, we must not afford to look back to the things of yesterday to miss what God is about to do in your life. Praise and worship team, if you would come play, please. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. On May 6, 1954, Roger Bannister became the first man in history to run a mile in less than four minutes. Within two months, John Landy eclipsed the record by 1.4 seconds. On August 7, 1954, the, the two met together for a historic race. As they moved into the last lap, Landy held the lead. It looked as if he would win. But as he neared the finish, he was haunted by the question, where is Bannister? As he turned to look, Bannister took the lead. Landy later told the Time Magazine reporter, if I hadn't looked back, he said, if I hadn't looked back, I would have won. I said, if I hadn't looked back, he said, I would have won. If we hadn't looked back to regret, if we hadn't looked back to the past, if we wouldn't look back to the things that we've fallen short of, we would have won. You would have seen your blessing. You would have seen your marriage put back together. We can't afford to look back in the day that we're living in today. What is causing you to look back from being the person that God has created you to be? What is causing you to look back from being the husband or even the wife that God has created you to be? And lastly, what is causing you to look back from moving forward to a new thing in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ? Behold, I will do a new thing. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, God. Lord, I gave it with everything within me, oh God. Lord, and I pray today Lord, that you will begin to convict. Lord, I pray today that you will begin to open hearts and open their ears to hear from you tonight. Lord, and I thank you. Help us tonight to not look back, but to look forward to what you're about to do in this church. Lord, to look forward to what you're about to do in this church with every head bowed and nobody looking around. There's a couple questions that I would like to ask you tonight. Maybe you're here, maybe you could say, you know what? I've been looking back. 
I said, I've been looking back. I've been looking back to going back to my old ways. I've been looking back to living a life in addiction, to living a life bound in sin. If you would say, you know what, that's me. I just need prayer tonight. I need Jesus in my life. Could you just raise your hand? Could you just raise your hand and say, you know what? I'm tired of looking back. I gotta move forward. I gotta move forward. Thank you, Jesus. And so I was praying. I believe that the Lord gave me something to say. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and he told me every person that is in the four walls of this church today, the Lord spoke to me and told me to tell you that every area of your life that you're in the area that you're struggling with tonight, God is going to do a new thing among you. And I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what you've been saying, what you've been thinking, but maybe you're here, maybe you could say, you know what? God help me to not look back. Lord, help me to not look back to miss the things that you're about to do in my life. God, help me to not look back, Lord, from experiencing another blessing from God. If you could say, you know what, that's that's me tonight. Help me, God. Lord, I want to experience that new thing. And, And God, if you need to experience a new thing, if you're ready to experience a new thing in God, would you raise your hand? If you want to experience a new thing in God, it's going to take faith. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take sacrificing your life. If we would all stand and if you would come down to an altar. Don't look back today. If y'all come down to an altar and just begin to pray. Begin to ask God to help you today. God, Lord, show us a new thing today. Lord, help us to understand tonight, God, Lord, that you are ready to do a new thing among us. Lord, that you are ready to pour out the Holy Ghost among us today, God. Lord, help us to not be satisfied. Lord, help us to not be. Help us today, God. Lord, that it is you today. Lord, I pray that you'll send a fresh anointing upon somebody tonight. Lord, I pray that an answer to prayer will come tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll put healing into somebody's body tonight. Lord, I pray that you will deliver somebody, set somebody free. God, Lord, help us to move forward and not to look back.